Today's scripture reading is Mark 3, 7 to 19. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard about all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the impure spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God! But he gave them strict orders not to tell others about him. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that they might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve that he appointed. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. If you are in kindergarten through fifth grade, we have Kids Connection for you. Miss Lisa is, is teaching. And uh, I know some of you are going to try to sneak out. We will be taking IDs, uh, checking ID at the door over there. So the rest of you, keep your Bibles open. If you haven't already opened it, open your Bible to Mark chapter 3. Um, so I just, I just need to say this. If you, um, anyone here is thinking of starting a motorcycle gang, I think Sons of Thunder uh, if you heard that, it would, would be a great one. I, and maybe there is one out there. I haven't heard, heard about it yet, but uh, um, that would be great. Hey, have you ever wondered why they listed all, all these names? And uh, uh, it's hard if you, if, by the way, some of you compare different Gospels, and you'll notice the names of the disciples, some of them seem to change from Gospel to Gospels, because you could have like three names. You could have the name you were given by your mom, and you have a, a Roman name, and then you have a, a nickname. So you had your, your, like your local name, the name you would use when you went other places, or, or the Roman name that you had. They could be all, all, all different. But one of the reasons that they're, they're listed here, um, or a couple, is one, because Jesus used people just like you and me. People that had strange or, or difficult uh, reputations <laughs> or nicknames to live down. Uh, and secondly, because when this gospel was written, some of these people were still around or their relatives were around or people they knew were around. And so the, the people hearing this gospel for the first time were reading it like, Bartholomew? I know Bartholomew. I'm going to go ask him. Did this really happen? Did you really get to hang out with Jesus? Or, or ask his siblings. And this is one reason we, we know these, are, these gospels are authentic. Because if someone had found that out, and then they, other people, the word would get spread. Hey, these gospels aren't true. They would not have made it down through history to us today. But because people were able to go and check out and ask others, then people realized, hey, everything that's written here really and truly happened. So there's a story in the Old Testament. Please keep your, your Bibles open this morning in chapter 3. We're going to focus on just a few verses. But there's a story in the Old Testament. It's in Jeremiah chapter 36. Um, where uh, God had said to Jeremiah, I want you to write down everything I've said to you and go read it to the people. So, so Jeremiah does this, and he has it read to, to the people. And someone tells the king at that time, now it was one of the bad kings. You read through the Old Testament king lists, and you're always wondering, you know, is this going to be a good king or a bad king? Good king or bad, bad king? Well, Jehoiakim was his name. He was a bad king. And one of the advisors says, we need to take this to the king. So they tell the king, and the king, and they go to his private quarters, and they start reading it to him. They take this scroll. And by the way, you saw some Hebrew letters up there today on the screen. These were written on scrolls by hand. There was no, you know, typing or dictating or anything like that. And so they're reading the scroll, the word of God from Jeremiah, and the king is listening. And they read about three lines, and he'd walk over to the scroll. He'd cut off that part, and he'd toss it into the fire. Stand back, they'd read a few more lines, he'd do the same thing until he had burned the entire scroll. Now I know what you're thinking, 
then how is it we have the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament? Poor Jeremiah had to write it again, uh, everything, and they kept that one from the king. Now, I know there's no one here that's cutting out portions of their Bible and burning it, right? All right, okay, just making sure. But there are parts of our Bible that we tend to, we don't cut out, but we overlook or glance over or ignore. Uh, usually they're the more difficult passages. So in effect, we're cutting them out by not really taking them seriously. For example, love the Lord your God with all your heart. We kind of like love the Lord your God. We get that. The all my heart thing. Well, I got to keep room in there for some other loves or love your neighbor. This one we don't cut out. We kind of add to love the majority of your neighbors. Got that, God. I can do that. Forgive others. You are to forgive others from the heart. That's a tough one. How about this one? Love your enemies. That's one we tend to, well, you know, um, the really good Christians do that, but the rest of us, we kind of get by. Today I want to talk to you. We're going to focus on a passage that we, we don't uh, glance over because it's difficult, although it is difficult. We glance over it or we ignore it because we just don't see it. We, we, we skip by it. Um, yet it's so important. And when I point it out to us, or actually when I let Mark point it out to us, we'll see, wow, this is something I have cut out or missed. It is so important to my walk, my faith with Jesus. So would you allow me to pray as we, as, before we continue on? Gracious, almighty God in heaven, we thank you for your word, how precious it is to us. And now we ask that as your word is inspired, that is written uh, by the empowerment and help and guidance of the Holy Spirit, that you, your spirit now would help us to hear, give us eyes to see and, and ears to hear, uh, minds to understand and hearts to receive what your spirit is saying to us through your word, through the, the gospel of Mark today. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. So before we get to the text, I want to ask you a, a quick question. What is, if you were to, to describe in a nutshell, what's the, the job description of a follower of Jesus? What's the top priority? What would you say? So uh, one top priority, uh, and if you were there are Bible studies this week, you don't get to answer, all right, because you know the end. Yeah. Well, what's a top priority? What are we supposed to do as followers Spread of Jesus? Spread the word. Amen. Preach it, brother. Come on up and do that, Kent. <laughs> no one's going to answer now. <laughs> Spread the word. Love others, Yes. Obey. Okay, very good. So, so, so right. right. Those, are, those are important. But we're about to find out they're not the most important thing. And I'm just telling you, before I was digging into the Word uh, this week and preparing for this, I th I, those were my answers. And then, and, well, y y you'll see. So, so here's the script for this morning. Don't look at your Bibles yet. I want you to look at what I call the TCV version. We'll call this the typical Christian version of the Bible. And you can see it behind me. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that he might send them out to preach and to have authority and to drive out demons. And when I read that to you just now, you went, yeah, that sounds right. That's what we read this morning. But it's, it's the TCV, the typical Christian version. Here's what it really says, and I, left the, 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 I took something out, and I left it crossed out so we can see this is what we do. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. You see that? <laughs> That's the first job description given to disciples, to followers of Jesus. That's the number one priority of followers of Jesus, to simply be with Jesus. But I, like you, say, no, the number one thing is we got to go out and do this or obey or preach the word. But the first thing he wants them to do is to simply be with him. This is Jesus' number one expectation of his disciples, to show up, to stick close. And in fact, uh, these other things, and he'll have them do, he does send them out to obey, to preach the word, to love. But he doesn't send them out uh, until, in Mark, anyways, until chapter 6, which for us is about three weeks uh, away. Once you, uh, once you see it, do you wonder how you missed it? Are you guys tracking with me? <laughs> and I probably should have put a version up there where it's not crossed out, but I wanted to just to emphasize what we do. Once you see it, you wonder, how did I, I miss it? 
And it actually has become, I think, a missing component in many of the lives of the followers of Jesus Christ to be with him. And, and our temptation here is to say, well, that's just a short little line. Uh, Mark didn't emphasize it. Well, well, one, consider this. In all the gospel of Mark, in all the gospels, what are the disciples doing? What's the one thing that they do? Following Jesus. They're with Jesus. They're sticking close to Jesus. Wherever he goes, where, where he walks, they walk. Where he, he, he sleeps, he, they sleep. Where he eats, they eat. So it's implied. <laughs> and sometimes things that are implied we just don't, don't see. And secondly, I want us to look again carefully at the, at the, at the passage in verse 13. And I'm not going to have it. Well, yeah, so go to the next slide. I want you, and you can look in your Bibles now too as well because I won't, I won't take any more out of the Bible this morning. So if I've, I've already, I've already uh, committed sacrilege. I, I produced a Bible. I took some words out. But the rest of these, there's no more tricks. I'll put it that way. First of all, notice that it's in the call that Jesus has to his disciples. Look at verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted. The call is first and foremost to Jesus Christ. It's not to a particular church. It's not to a particular denomination. It's not to a particular teacher of, of the gospel or to a teaching First and foremost, we are called to be with Jesus. Um, many reject Jesus. They distance themselves from Jesus because they've had a bad experience uh, with, with the church. Some of you know this. Some of you uh, have experienced this. Uh, and once in a while, I get to talk to someone like that. And, and you can kind of use this logic. You say, well, do you reject all medical care because you had a bad experience with a doctor? You know, do you, uh, and I had this written in before we actually had a retired fireman in, in with us today, but do you stop calling the fire department because you had a bad experience with one fireman? No. And, and so uh, you don't stop your relationship with Jesus because you had a bad experience with one Christian or one, one, one church. We're always going to have those because we're not perfect. The perfect one who never blows it in our relationship with him is, is Jesus. He's the priority. And the first call of our lives is to him. And, and I, I say that because we need the church. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you don't need the church. You need the church because Jesus set it up that way. We need to be with other Christians worshiping. We need to be together. But sometimes that denomination or that group you're involved in with the church or that can overshadow or a person can overshadow Jesus. You follow me on this? We, we get there. Oh, man, you read this author? You got to read this guy. He's great. He's great. And he may be great or she may be great. But be careful <laughs> that uh, what that teacher is, is, instead of pulling you into what they're teaching, should be pushing you to a closer relationship with Jesus, being with Jesus. Uh, so not only is in the call, you saw that in verse 13, but also uh, in verse 13 we see this. It's in the response. And they came to him. I think I got those slides re reversed, uh, uh, J.D., so go back to the other one. That's my bad. Uh, and they came to him. We think they came, uh, now what we think is they came to him and said, okay, Jesus, what do you want us to do now? <laughs> right? All right, Jesus, I'm here. What do you want me to do? But he said, I just want you to be, for now, with me. That's your first priority and always your first priority is to be with me. When someone calls you and you, they want to get together, hey, let's get together for lunch or coffee. Aren't we all a bit cynical? What do they want? What's the ask going to be, right? Are you with me on that? No, that never happens to anybody else. Someone calls, hey, it's been a long time. Let's get together. Oh, no, they're going to want something. Isn't it nice when you go to that coffee and you find out they just wanted to hang out? Do you feel a sense of, of relief? Whew. That's a Jesus' first priority to us. I just want you to be with me. More will come, but the first priority is that you hang out and be with me. By the way, this is how we become Christians. Have you ever considered this question? Were the disciples at this point in their journey, were they Christians? And the answer has to be no, because to be a Christian, you have to uh, 
receive Jesus, not only as your Lord and Savior, but believe that he died and rose again. And had he died and rose again? Yeah, no. And not only that, they didn't really get who Jesus was. They knew he was the Messiah, right? They believed that. But when Jesus says, by the way, I have to go to Jerusalem and die, they said, no, 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 Jesus, that's not the way it's going to happen. So they didn't get who Jesus was yet. How was it they came to tr truly become followers of Christ? By being with Jesus. And they stuck with him in, in difficult times. Even after they betrayed him, he stuck with them. That's when they uh, would finally become Christians. And that's, that's what we need to understand too. It is in being with Jesus that our understanding of who he is and our commitment to Him and our faith to Him begin to uh, grow and become what they are, are supposed to be. So I want to talk about being with Jesus by being in His presence. I think that's what Mark wants us to understand today, that we need to be with Jesus. And I just want to encourage you uh, this week. I know that I, I, we always have the assignment that you have to, uh, I want you to read and, and dig into. Uh, and it's at the bottom of your, uh, of the, on the back of the bulletin. Read and dig into uh, the text for next Sunday uh, that Becky will be preaching from. But I want to encourage you too this week to just be focused on these verses 13 through 15 that Jesus appointed the 12, especially 14, that they might be with him. What does it mean to be with Jesus? How important is it that we have the presence of Jesus in our lives? We need the presence of Jesus. Uh, one thing we've learned in this epidemic of shutdowns is that Shutdowns are not healthy for us emotionally or spiritually. To be away from other, and it actually turns out physically, uh, but to be away from other people is not a good thing. Remember that, was it the movie uh, Castaway with Tom Hanks? <laughs> he was so desperate for a person at the end that he made a friend out of a, uh, I think it was a volleyball, right, that he called Wilson. Uh, any of you had to, quarantine, do the quarantine during this, this period. I had to do the quarantine for, for ten, at that point, and if I'd only gotten COVID a week later, it would only have been seven days, but at that point, it was a 10-day quarantine, and so I am up in my, in my room, quarantined for my family, and the first day was wonderful, just to tell you, I liked it. <laughs> it's like, hey, this is great, and then I realized I'm, I'm missing them. I'm, I'm missing people, and then it would, the worst was when I would hear them talking and laughing downstairs, and uh, at first, you know, I'm paranoid. Are they talking and laughing about me? And I realize I'm not there, so probably not. But I was missing out. And the, the rest of that time was, was very, it was, it was difficult. Um, uh, Lisa and I would we'd watch shows together and text each other and make com comments and stuff like that. And because it, we just aren't meant to be away from other people. Are you with me? So with other people, being with other people brings... Um, gives us what we, we need, how much greater is our need to be with the one who is a person, capital P? You following me? So if, if, if being with the, maybe the person you're sitting, look around, person you're sitting next to, if that person, it's good to be in that person's presence, and they're just a person with a small P, <laughs> to be in the presence of the one who is God Almighty, to be in the presence of Jesus, how much greater is my need? How much greater is my, practically speaking, my emotional and my spiritual need to be in the presence of Jesus? When we are not in the presence of Jesus, we're missing out on the most joyful, most caring, listening, empowering person who ever lived. If there's one presence we need to be in, it's the presence of Jesus how many of you, as it sounds strange to us, when you hear this idea, Jesus laugh? Jesus laugh. In fact, I have, there's this famous painting, and I've, um, I've actually seen a bust made of this. It's really cool. It's called Jesus Laughing. And the first time I saw it was not a painting. The first time I came across this uh, when I was in school was this little bust of Jesus, and his head's you know, cocked back just like this, and he's laughing. And I thought, I've never pictured Jesus that way before. In fact, there are a lot of great gospel movies out there, uh, but, uh, and, uh, and some good ones. I always like to recommend the Jesus movie. It came out, I think, in 79. 
Um, and there's one scene in the Jesus movie that I can recall when Jesus is at Nicodemus' house. And Nicodemus, remember, he's supposedly a short guy. And Nicodemus uh, wanted to give his treasure. Once he meets Jesus, he wants to give uh, things away to the poor, his treasure away to the poor. And he has to get it. And it's hidden behind a, a, a painting on the wall. And in order to get there, he has to move a stone and step up to get to it. And Jesus starts laughing. And the disciples are laughing. And that's one of my favorite scenes because most of the images we have of Jesus, he's dour and down. But if he's the person we need to be in the presence of, many times Jesus laughs. If our joy is missing, then I would say probably a key reason for that is we are not in the presence of the one who created joy and is the source of all joy. And his joyful presence. Can we say amen to that? We, we, need, to, we need this presence. Uh, secondly, it's the presence of Jesus grounds us in reality. It, it helps to correct misconceptions of our faith that can actually do us harm and cause us to be disappointed in God. I don't know about you. I find myself disappointed in God a lot. And when those times I'm disappointed in God, it's always because of a misconception. I expected something of God that I didn't get. So let me just give you an example because... Jesus is telling the disciples, hey, I want you to come with me. But I imagine they, they heard it differently. Hey, we're going to go travel with Jesus. And look how popular he is. We'll probably stay in some pretty nice hotels. I hear we're going to go to the big city, Jerusalem. Won't that be great? And they're going to have this parade. I'm sure Jesus will be on some very distinguished animal in the parade. And then afterwards, there's this dinner party. And it's going to be a dinner to end all dinners. It's going to be such a great dinner, they're going to call it the last dinner. And then after that, there's a party in the garden. We're going to stay up all night. And then we're going to get to meet some very high-ranking officials. We're going to get to see Herod and, and Pilate and, and the high priest even. And then Jesus is going to be lifted up for everyone to see. Won't it be awesome? <laughs> Did they get it wrong? Uh, uh, yeah, they, they, there's a yes and no there. Yeah, all those things happen, but not the way they expected. When we are in the, get to be called to be with Jesus, it's just ordinary life. Sometimes I can be disappointed. You can, you can say, oh, I'm going to go to this prayer time. Like we had a prayer time this morning. Did the Holy Spirit fall? Was there fire from heaven? No. But it sure was good being in the presence of God and being in the presence of others as we just simply prayed to God. There's a lot of simple ordinariness and normality in being with Jesus. And it's not taking away. It's not giving us the four-star four hotel ride or the great cruise. It's, it's not taking away any of the difficulties of life. It's simply this. It's the ordinary life. And the ordinary challenges of life with the key difference that Jesus is present with us and guiding us through. Remember Jesus had prayed this one prayer in, in John, I think in John 17, that uh, none of them would be lost <laughs> except what he called the son of perdition who was Judas Iscariot. Through all those difficulties that we just mentioned, all the disciples, even though it was a difficult journey, they came through because of the presence of Jesus. Thirdly, the presence of Jesus changes us in ways we don't expect or even want to be changed. I think this is the most dangerous thing about the presence of Jesus. Now, some people, uh, you'll, you'll hear, I've actually, it's been a long time since someone said this to me, but they were afraid to come to church and get involved in Christianity. He said, because God might call me to be a missionary. Anybody ever have that, that fear before? <laughs> God might call me to be a missionary. I want to say, that's the least of your fears. You know, I, I would rather be called to be a missionary than have the work God wants to do inside me and in transforming me, my wants, my priorities. Those are the hard things. And here's the challenge. The presence of Jesus will change us in ways we don't expect or want, transforming our, our, our character, <clears throat> our hearts, our minds. I have the image. I hope it comes through. It kind of does this. So on, on the, sorry, on the left, that's us. That's our we're inward focused people. Me, me, me. What I want, what I got to do, and what Jesus is doing. And I think that thing in the center is supposed to be a brain there. 
uh, what Jesus represents us, what Jesus is doing is turning us to outward focused people. That means more giving than receiving. Now, if you grew up in America and you believed in Santa Claus when you were a kid, we were trained <laughs> to know the best thing that happens on Christmas morning is Santa has brought me stuff and I get my gifts. And if someone told you at that young age, hey, one day, it's going to be even better. You're going to enjoy giving gifts to others. You would have called them a fool and told them to get away. You'd say, I'd rather be a missionary to China than be someone who wants to give rather than receive. Are you following me? But as we follow Jesus, it's a slow change of our priorities and our plans and our wants and the things we consider most important. He changes us from those who, who judge others from a distance to those who care for other people up close. He changes us from those um, who hate to the, uh, and, and are filled with passion to hate people to those who are filled with compassion for people. He changes our, our calendar priorities, our spending our priorities, that instead of revolving around our wants, they revolve around the needs, the true needs of others we go from loving to receive to loving to give from shopping on rodeo drive to sweeping and cleaning the streets no one has heard of from complaining about what's um, being what's not being done to stepping up and and serving and helping in ways we were just complaining about there's a story going around it's one of those uh you know you love the internet because they have these great stories. They tug at your heart. And I'm telling you, most of them aren't true, um, probably. But I'll tell this one anyway. So it's a story of a person who went uh, and didn't happen in California. I think it happened in Texas. And they went to a, a fast food restaurant. <clears throat> and uh, they were upset because the line was long, the service was slow, and the tables were dirty. And they finally got their meal and they sat down at a table they cleaned off and, and looked. And this, this woman, um, she's eating and she noticed... Uh, everybody else was upset like she was. And the manager was, was trying, to, you know, didn't have enough employees because, because it just that's the way it is right now. You can't find enough employees. The manager was, was doing the best they could to, to, to keep things running in the kitchen and, in, and behind the counter. And finally it clicked. Maybe I should offer to help. So she walked up to the manager and said, uh, and the manager said, can I help? Yeah, would you give me a cleaning rag and some spray and I'll go around and clean these tables. The manager said, no, no, we wouldn't make you do that. She says, look, I see what you're going through. I know it's busy. You can't find enough employees and people. Hey, business is, is like it's never been before. I'm happy to do it. Now, some of you are going, hey, isn't that a liability issue? Hey, just, just enjoy the story, okay? <laughs> and so he gave her the cleaning spray and the rag, and she went and cleaned all those tables. And suddenly she realized my attitude had changed. <laughs> I was no longer saying, those people need to fix this problem. I was part of the solution to the problem. And, and I think this is what Jesus does in our, our lives. And we'd rather sit in the, what's wrong with it? Look what's wrong with everything, rather than a, God has changed me to help, to serve, to fix the issue, if, if you will. Fourthly, the presence of Jesus takes us places we wouldn't normally go. Back in chapter 2, uh, Jesus took his disciples uh, to a party. And again, you know, I'm sure they're going, we're going to a party. And it was at the house of this guy named Levi, which, all right, Levi's a tax collector. He's a bad guy. He's a sinner. But now he's following Jesus and he's rich, which means there's going to be some good food at the party. And of course, they get there and it's all the losers of the town have showed up. It's, it's people that had no uh, other life. The, the bad people, if, if you will, had showed up, the, uh, was the other tax collectors, sinners, ex-cons, general losers, drug addicts, homeless people, prostitutes. They all showed up to soak in the, the light and, and the love of the kingdom of God through Jesus. And at that point, the disciples are like, I don't know if I want to be here, right? <laughs> and if you will persist in being allowing Jesus to be present in your life, to seek the presence of Jesus, to be with him. You will find yourselves in the homes of neighbors you never thought you'd be in their homes. 
uh, having lunch with someone you never thought you would have lunch with. Um, being a light of Jesus Christ, a light of the kingdom of God to someone you didn't expect to be a, a light to. And I believe in that situation, by the way, that's also where the presence of Jesus is. Because where two or more are gathered in my name. And if you're there in the name of Jesus and you're being a light to that person, then certainly Jesus is there shining through you. And that too is being a part of the pre presence of Jesus as he's opening up your heart for for them. Maybe this has already happened to you. And, and we have this list right now. Uh, we call it our, our oikos list. Oikos is the Greek word for, for household or um, your relational network. And we've been filling out names. And I want to encourage you, if you didn't get one of these cards, to take one. If you need an extra one, take an extra one. We have plenty of them. And to be filling out this list, and I've shared with some, when I started the list, I think I, I did like eight. And, uh, uh, and then... Um, the next day I did a couple more, and now I have, I have 14. And so um, maybe I'll have the full list filled out by, by next week. And these are people that God is opening up our, our hearts to. This is what happens in the presence of Jesus. We are in the presence of Jesus when, point five, this last point here, two or more are gathered. When we worship together, as we do on Sunday mornings, we are in the presence of Jesus. When we take communion together, we're in the presence of Jesus in a special way. When we're reading Scripture together, and I'm going to go through our, our Lenten plan. So in Lent, we are listening to the Word of God, reading two psalms in the morning. And this is part of the sheet, by the way. Two psalms in the morning and reading um, a psalm at night. We're in the presence of Jesus. Because right? you're hopefully you're asking the question in this sermon, uh, in this message, how do I get in the presence of Jesus? I mean, the disciples just walked over to him. How do we do it today? Well, we have the Holy Spirit. And I know, I know I'm tempted to think this way. It's not fair. If I could have been in the presence of Jesus like the disciples were in the presence of Jesus, which is the real presence of Jesus, it would be a lot easier. But we have been given something that makes it fair, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And we're in the presence of Jesus, empowers us to be in the presence of Jesus, and it's no less potent, are you following me, than it was for the disciples to be in the flesh and blood presence of Jesus. Now, you just have to believe that by faith because the Bible says so. <laughs> and one day we'll be in the ultimate presence of Jesus. That's what we long for. But we won't long for the ultimate presence of Jesus unless we're striving to be in his presence today by listening to his word, by entering into his presence through prayer. Folks, I, I shared with you, if you join us during this Lenten journey, if you're only doing this for 15 minutes a day, that's good. Because you just sneak your foot into the doorway of the presence of Jesus and you'll find yourself wanting more and more of Him. And I, and I say 15 minutes because that's just my estimation. You know, two psalms in the morning, a psalm at night, time in prayer, <clears throat> even if it's just going slowly over the Lord's Prayer and praying for those on your Oikos list, you know, 10 to 15 minutes, you will find yourself wanting more of the presence of Jesus. Through the season of Lent, we're also practicing uh, fasting, and you can well, find the instructions here on the card, and also getting togethering. So gathering together with God's people in worship, gathering together in a, in a small group where we, we study His Word and pray and encourage each other. Uh, Jesus is present there as well. Getting together with others for lunch. Are you following me? These are the ways we get into the presence of Jesus, but we have this habit of <clears throat> coughing. No. Hitting the snooze button. <clears throat> How many of you, should I even ask a question? Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Snooze people. How many of you use snooze on your phones? Or, okay, amen. Okay, you're honest. Come on, keep the hands up. All right, let's do it. How many of us use snooze? Come on. No one else uses snooze? All right, a few of us. All right, how many of you are five snoozes before you, you, you turn it off? Whoa. How many of you are just three snoozes? Oh, we got one five. I can't see who's back there. We got a five snoozer back there. <laughs> Uh, I'm a three snoozer. I hit the button at least three times. Who, who are the really disciplined people? You only hit it once. Anyone? I didn't think so. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, Holly, once in a while, gets it to one time. We, put, we hit the snooze button on being in the presence of Jesus. I'll get to that later. I'll go to church next week. I'll open up my Bible tomorrow. 
I'll do this. And the time now, especially in the season of Lent, is to stop hitting the snooze button and get into the presence of Jesus. You say amen to that? The first priority of a disciple of Jesus is to be in his presence. I want to say that one more time. I'm going to invite you to stand with me as I, I'm going to pray, uh, kind of uh, cl close out the message, and I'm going to pray that God prepare our hearts as we take uh, communion. And I do need to move this microphone stand. Oh. So I'll come down there to pray to do that. Uh, Erwin, could you just move that to the side here so that, like right here, so those who are come up to serve communion will be able to do that. Thank you. Let's pray. Gracious, almighty God, <laughs> I confess to you I miss this. I'm a, Jesus, what do you want me to go do uh, kind of person. And your first invitation, your priority for disciples is to be in your presence, that you may do a work and continue the work that you have done in me. Lord, help us to be a little bit frightened this morning <clears throat> about the work that you want to do in us. Perhaps we're afraid to let go of certain priorities, of certain um, attitudes that we cherish. We're afraid of your word when it says to forgive and to love. and to give ourselves. We confess that to you. But in hearing this message and understanding your call, we acknowledge, we confess that our greatest need is to be in the presence, in your presence, Jesus, and to trust by um, the gift of your Holy Spirit that you are present with us when we gather together, when we read your word, when we pray that you are doing a work in us, that you do love us, that you are transforming us to be more like you. Forgive us, Lord, for hitting the snooze button on being in your presence. And I pray, God, that you would lay it on our hearts. Maybe for some this is just is starting. Okay, I'm going to you know, read uh, two psalms in the morning and a psalm in the evening. And pray to you, even if it's just, Jesus, help me through this day. And to, if you will, sneak into your presence and Jesus do a work in us. Let us find how much we enjoy, but also how much we need. And how real is your presence. Prepare our hearts now as we, we, we take communion, as we celebrate your, the Lord's Supper together. We ask this in your precious name, dear Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen. You, you may be seated.